Good morning, church. I hope everyone is having a good start to their Sunday morning. We thank you for being here and we welcome you here with us this morning as well as those of you who are joining us online. It is a good day to be together uh, with our church family. Today we, we uh, are doing things uh, a little different. We've kind of moved back to the back and um, even though we've kind of moved towards the back, it's still a little sparse, uh, still a little spread out here. We've got a lot of people who are traveling. Um, several of you, I think, uh, have been traveling and are back, but uh, others who are kind of returning uh, from a much needed break, a uh, much needed fall break and enjoying the opportunity of that. My kids actually are in Alabama with my mom. Uh, this morning, they went down yesterday, actually, uh, Liddy Kate and my nephew Jonah went to the Auburn-Georgia game, um, and, and while it didn't turn out quite like they would have wanted, they did get to experience uh, their first SEC game, and so uh, I think that was just a neat opportunity for them, but they're down in Alabama, me and Lindsay are heading down tomorrow, we had a couple things that we had to take care of, but um, we're doing that, so uh, just pray for, for us and pray for all those who are traveling right now. You know, I always enjoy breaks, I always enjoy uh, good good vacations or just just a change in routine and um, and taking advantage of those and what they mean and as much as it is about being with family and about being with friends it also just allows me the opportunity to reset the opportunity to to refocus and um, even see things from a different perspective and I don't think it's anything unlike what Jesus did regularly that we see him throughout Scripture going off by himself to spend time with the Father, to be renewed, to be recentered, to be strengthened for all that was ahead of him. But I also think there was a large part of that was about him being with God and being reminded that God is there with him, that God is there walking alongside him through everything that he was going through. And I think we even see a glimpse of that with what Jesus cried out when he was on the cross, just his struggle with the fact that God's presence wasn't there with him in that moment. And, and so I think those times when Jesus was with God, it was that reminder for him as well. And I think our time together this morning serves some of those exact same purposes. Yes, we're here to worship. We're here to honor. We're here to acknowledge God and who he is and what he's doing. But it's also a time to be renewed, a time to be reminded. Because if we're not careful, it's really easy to just allow this to become a part of our routine, allow this to become a box that we checked or a task that we cross off our list. So as we begin this morning, I want us to do so mindfully, do so intentionally, and enter into this time together being reminded of what this is all about, that not only do we have a God who loves us immensely, but we have a God who is always there with us who won't be taken away from us and who won't remove himself from us. He is there. And so we're going we're gonna to start by uh, reading some scripture together. And so if everybody will please stand, we're going to read this time of scripture as we enter into uh, God's word. I'm going to read what's in white and then we'll t read together uh, what's in yellow. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare his own son but gave him up for all of us. Won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. He is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? For I am convinced that neither life nor death nor angels nor demons nor the present nor the future nor the any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I will call upon the Lord, I will call upon the Lord who will 
is worthy to be praised, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and so shall I be saved from my enemies. I know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord. That with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Please be seated. The family that prays together stays together. Our Father in heaven, as we approach your throne this morning, we have so many things to be thankful for. It is so hard for us to imagine to where to begin. But let us say, Father, you've stooped down to where we could come to you because we can never reach up to your level. And Father, we thank you for being with us during this pandemic. We thank you for those that who have recovered and for those that are recovering. Help us to remember that if a small germ can interrupt our lives, imagine what the faith of a mustard seed can do. We are so thankful that we have a God that can do anything but fail. Father, we often disappoint you, let you down, but we are so thankful to know that you say, please accept my mercy, please accept my grace. That's all I've asked of you because Father, you know that we are weak. And we're so thankful that we are not perfect because if we were, we wouldn't need anyone. But Father, we need you more each and every day 
that we live. And Father, I want to thank you for these six men that serve as your shepherds. I thank you for Rick Minkley, Larry Bourne, Ben Collier, Tim Hinton, Corey Morgan, and Phil Sanders. We know these men put in long hours that we never know about to help build this congregation up and to do what is best for us and our community. And Father, we pray that you will give them a long and useful life upon this earth and in your kingdom. And Father, I want to also thank you for my brother Martin, our brother Martin, for the long hours that he spends preparing when he stands before us to bring us the message. And we are so thankful, Father, that he tells us what we need to hear, not what we want to hear. I also pray for him and his family and the other ministers here that you will also give them a long life on this earth. Pray that you will give these men wisdom each and every day. And Father, again, we just want to say a simple thank you for everything that you do for us. And we ask you to forgive us for what we are not, but search our hearts, change us, and help us change, if you will, to become the courageous men and women that, and, that you would want us to be. And let us never be afraid to let our light shine. We're all here this morning because someone touched our lives and had made a positive impact on us. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. Will you please continue to choose out our changes? And we are gratefully yours. In the name of Jesus, we pray and amen. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I've known that we're all searching for answers. Only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Cause you're perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways Yes, you're perfect in all of your ways To us You're perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways To Love so undeniable, I can, I can hardly speak. Peace so unexplainable, I, I can hardly think as you call me. Deeper still as you call me. Deeper still as you call me. Deeper still into love 
Our scripture this morning, I'll be reading from Revelations 2, 18 through 29. And the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these, words, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love, and your faith your service and perseverance and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead, then all the church churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teachings 
and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any burden, any other burden on you, except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over nations. The one that one will rule them with an iron scepter and I will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears will let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Appreciate so much the uh, reading today, and uh, and and thankful for that. We're going to be uh, launching into our our study of of a small town. I I, uh, I consider it a blessing that in my ministry I have served churches in a number of small towns uh, in in Como, Mississippi, in Kaufman, Texas, in Blyville, Arkansas. Oak Ridge would be a a, a small town as well. And, uh, of course, we live out in Pegram now, uh, probably the smallest, I guess Como was about the smallest, but a small little town as well. Uh, served a church in Lobaville, a uh, small town. So uh, I have a, a real appeal, or I understand the appeal of a small town. Uh, most of the small towns, though, that we know of are fictional. Uh, Mayberry and Hooterville. Uh, and, and don't forget Little House on the Prairie, Walnut Grove, Minnesota. And uh, to get a little bit more current, uh, Friday Night Lights was Dillon, Texas. And uh, hey, look, we've all had uh, Virgin River put on the, on the map again by Netflix. And so uh, awaiting the next season of that one coming along. So small towns are, are all around us uh, in, in our world. Uh, there are small towns in the Bible. And so Nazareth and Bethlehem and Capernaum and Cana, uh, they were all small towns as well. And, and to that number and to that list, we need to add the, uh, the town of Thyatira, our destination of Christ's email in this series that we have been looking at. Uh, as in those previous lessons, uh, I, I've tried to kind of sketch some of the glorious past of some of these amazing churches uh, and the locations where they were and the fact that, that you've got populations that literally number in the hundreds of thousands and you've got theaters and you've got libraries and, and you've got these magnificent structures built out of the finest of marble, okay? Because many of these cities that we've been talking about are, are like Chicago or Detroit or Los Angeles or, or maybe even New York. But when we get to Thyatira, well, we're not going to be talking about much of that. Because Thyatira was a small little place on a confluence of a couple of roads with a population that never really uh, exceeded more than about 30,000 or so. It was famous for the fact that it, it was a place where wool was dyed purple. And I would remind you over in the book of Acts that the Apostle Paul, when he's at Philippi, meets a young woman by the name of Lydia, who is apparently a pretty successful merchant in trading this cloth. And so, in a sense, if we imagine a community like Pergamum that we studied last week, if that's Detroit, well, Thyatira is Flint, Michigan, okay? It's a union town. It's a production facility, okay? It's where the guilds of the day ruled the time. Now, 
that's going to have a key impact on the setting and circumstance of this letter. So I want to develop that a little bit more. But, but I want to just up front stop and, and just make an observation, okay? I, I find it ironic that the smallest church, or I should say the smallest community, gets written the longest letter. And, and that even though this is a small town, it still is seen and is on the radar, if you will, of Jesus. And, and so can I just say small churches matter to our Lord? I, I know we're in a day of mega churches, and if you haven't got 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 in attendance, it's very easy to have a, a, a complex, you know, a, well, we can't do anything or we can't be anything, we can't accomplish anything. Look, this letter is a reminder that God sees a tribal church that meets on a remote island. He sees the persecuted church in Afghanistan and in China, and he recognizes small churches even like ours. So, so let's just remember it never to say, my church is too small for Jesus to see us or to notice even when we're on the back porch. And so we're in Revelation chapter 2 this morning, and, and, and let's set some of that background. I, I shared with you uh, last week and in a couple of our prior lessons that a key part of understanding what is going on in the book of Revelation is emperor worship. And, and this notion that the emperor is divine and we have to pay and give alms to him, and, and, and we have to notice and see him and recognize him. That's a, that's a critical part of what's going on. For this week, though, I'm going to add another item, another focus that deeply impacts churches of this era and, and Christians in the first century. In the Roman era individuals who shared a trade with one another often bound themselves together. And, and they formed associations. They formed guilds. The, the Greek word was syndicate. The Latin term was a collegium. And what's interesting is, even though Thyatira was a small, out-of-the-way place, we have more references to those type of gatherings in the community of Thyatira than in any other province in all of Asia. Uh, these, these guilds would, would form around wool workers and linen workers and folks who made outer garments, uh, dyers, leather workers, tanners, potters, bakers, bronze smiths. All of those have archaeological records they left behind for having guilds, these groups that met together in the city and community of Thyatira. Now, each of those would control roughly 100% of the practice of their industry in that community. If you want a modern example, Screen Actors Guild, there's the word. Anything that happens in Hollywood happens in connection to what happens with the Screen Actors Guild, the writers and, and those performers and others. Uh, it, it doesn't use the word, okay, but the National Association of Realtors. If you sell a house, what do you pay as a commission? Huh? Realtors fee, how much is it? 6%. In almost every instance, it's 6%. Why? Because of the National Association of Realtors. They, quote, unquote, control the market, right? And, and you almost have to be a part of that group and agree to a 6% commission to be able to work within that group. It, it, it's self-policed, if you will. The American Medical Association, another example of that. Why, shucks, the American Kennel Club. What is a license or a real breed of dog? Who decides? AKC. And so you see, we have these groups that have power today. I, I am a member, I'm a certified financial professional. Uh, I'm a CFP, okay? 
And, and so as a CFP, our group establishes training and exams and other types of practices that one has to do. These ancient guilds were much like a, a, a union or one of these associations, okay? They would try to maintain prices for their goods. They would try to maintain quality for those goods, different standards, okay? Now, in the first century, there is a major distinction, okay? In the first century, all of these are tied to a deity. And, and within that background, I would just kind of remind you, in Acts chapter 19, there is a riot in the city of Ephesus. It is led by a guy by the name of Demetrius. Demetrius is a silversmith. He's probably the head or the lead of the silversmith guild in Ephesus. And he's upset because if, if Paul is successful in converting everybody to Christianity, nobody is going to want the statues of Artemis that they make. And, and so we find reference to these types of groups all the way through the empire, and, and they basically share some common characteristics. First of all, they will meet periodically to talk about business, okay? And in 100% of those cases, in every record that we have in antiquity, their meetings begin with a sacrifice to their deity. They all have an association or a connection to a patron god or, or goddess, and, and they are going to pay homage to that. They're going to sacrifice the meat that's going to be shared in their meeting, all right, uh, to that particular deity. And so it's kind of like a chamber of commerce meeting. It's like a rotary meeting, right? What do we do? We start with the pledge to the flag. We might have a short prayer, okay? Well, they are offering meat to their God. And then they share the meal that is part of that sacrifice that's been made, and that's where they have their business meeting. And then things have not changed a whole lot in 2,000 or so years. Once the formal meeting is, around, is finished up, there are a significant number of these folks that stick around and they have a little bit of extra drinking and they have a little bit of party and a little bit more drinking and a little bit more party and things get a little bit, well, you kind of know how that kind of stuff goes, okay? I mean, it's kind of like spring break, okay? It's kind of like Urban Meyer. It's kind of like a Las Vegas convention. It's kind of like, you know, you just kind of sketch it out downtown, transportainment, a bachelorette party in Broadway. It's not a very healthy environment for a Christian. But if you're in the trades in Thyatira, you're pretty much caught. And so that becomes a problem. And that's where this email to the church at Thyatira falls along. And, and as it unfolds, even though it's the longest, it, it still comes in the same outline pretty much that we see. There is a connection to the opening vision. Jesus identifies himself as the Son of God. The only time that's done, not only in the letters, it's the only time it happens in the entire book of Revelation. And that's probably because the main deity that was worshipped in Thyatira was Apollo. And Apollo was known as the Son of Zeus. And so Jesus, in identifying himself as the Son of the real God, is the antithesis of Apollo is the son of Zeus, the unreal God. Next, there's the I know statement. We anticipate that. And, and I love the way that it's captured in the, in the reading of Peterson's message. I see everything you're doing for me. Impressive. The love and the faith, the service and persistence, yes, very impressive. You get better at it every day. Now, you remember the email to the church at Ephesus? They had got off to a good start, but their problem was, you remember, they had lost their first love. 
not the guys at Thyatira, right? You get better every day. And so remember, these are letters that are to be read by all the churches, and they are to learn from what's being said in the comments that are given to one another. So everything sounds great at Thyatira so far. But then there is a lengthy complaint. Again, the longest in the series. And once again, we have a New Testament problem that's going to be given or addressed with an Old Testament image, okay? And the figure here is Jezebel. Now, I'm not going to go into near as much detail about Jezebel as I did Balaam from last week, okay? But a couple of items. Jezebel is a bad woman, okay? I mean, she is about as bad of a bad woman as exists. If you want to know how bad of a bad woman Jezebel is, just try to think about how many of your friends are named Jezebel. Okay? Do you know, I checked the census records from 2019. There were five unfortunate children who were named Jezebel in 2019. Frankly, I, I think Jezebel's a great name for a Doberman, right? I got an attack dog. Come on, Jezebel, go after him. But I'm not worried about Ronnie and Stephanie naming their little girl Jezebel. Okay? Not going to happen. All right? We don't name our little girls Jezebel. Why? Because she's a bad woman. Okay? She's married to King Ahab. Now, that's horrible in and of itself. All right? But she is a Phoenician who is an evangelist. She's a Phoenician evangelist who's going to convert her husband Ahab and all of the nation of Israel into followers of her god, Baal. And the truth is, she's incredibly successful. If it wasn't for the actions of God intervening through the prophet Elijah, who knows where things would have gone. Now, in Revelation 2, verse 20, Jezebel is at Thyatira. Now, now, that's likely not her given name, but like this Old Testament model, this woman who's there is leading the people of God astray. And, and the text picks up on two or three items as part of this. Uh, uh, she's taken on authority. She's misleading a Christian. She, she's basically telling them that she can have it all, all right? They can have God, they can have Jesus, they can have heaven, they can be a good Christian, and oh, by the way, they can sacrifice to idols, they can have this affinity and friendship with the world, and they can have, frankly, as much guilt-free sex as they desire. And that follows in the patterns of Jezebel from the Old Testament. Now, in Thyatira, here's the key, all of that is connected to the actions of those guilds that we talked about a few minutes ago. So, see, Thyatira's Jezebel, she is promoting toleration and engagement. And she says, look, if you go to those guild meetings, why, it's not anything real. It's just a ritual. It's just a form. Everybody agrees that. You just look the other way. You just hold your nose and, and go through it. I, I mean, you, that's just the price of taking care of your family. You know, that's just what it takes to just go along with it. it, it it's not that bad. Furthermore, some might even have gone so far as to say, look, if we're going to reach our community, if we're going to reach our world, we've got to be connected to it. And so, therefore, this... These guilds are, are a way of you connecting with the lost. There are all kinds of modern examples of that same mentality. I remember hearing when I was younger an uh, individual who got caught up in some practices in his work uh, that were diametrically opposed to some of the things that were part of the Christian principles and basics. And, and his statement was, well... This is business. And so there was a separation, you see, between spirituality and one's vocation. And the problems, whether they're at Thyatira or in Nashville, 
is that no matter what the intent, you see, behavior often leads to moral compromise. And so, Jesus responds. And in that response, in that correction, has told Jezebel and their followers that they've got to quit this, that they've got to repent, they've got to change. But they're not responding. And, and what the text that Rod shared with us shows is that as a result of that, there's going to be a cascade that comes down. And it's going to be a troubling path. There's going to be physical suffering for the leader. There are going to be problems for their followers and finally even death. And the language, as I read it here in the text, seems to me to at least to, to be literal as opposed to emotional or, or, or figurative. It, it very obviously was intended to be a clear warning. Again, remember, these letters are to be shared among the other churches. Everybody is to understand you cannot, in these sister congregations, act this way. God's patience, you see, does have a limit. And if we persist in sin, uh, then... The letter to Thyatira reminds us that judgment will come. But even in that, there is an encouragement because although Jezebel has influenced many at Thyatira, there are many who, again, have not followed that enticement. Instead, Jesus assures those individuals that they will be rewarded and the email ends with an encouragement an encouragement that all the churches need to pay attention to now as i step back away from this email it's pretty easy to draw some basic conclusions for us today because ultimately this is a message not just for those churches but for our congregation too Every generation of Christians must face a basic question. And that is, how far should I go in accepting and adopting the cultural standards and behavior of my day? Or stated another way, where does being contemporary cross over to compromise? Christians, you see, are always going to be caught between two worlds. We are citizens of two countries, two communities, if you will, and we can't ultimately renounce either of those. We are citizens of the earth. We are citizens of this world where we are. And at the same time, we are citizens of heaven. The cause of Christ is not served if Christians come across as dinosaurs who are trying to hide from the real world. But at the same time, and by the same token, the cause of Christ isn't advanced if, if we buy wholesale into the world's values and become chameleon Christians who are indistinguishable from our world's permanent residence. It's a difficult pathway. And what we see in these emails here in Revelation 2 and 3 are really the first steps of Christian communities that are trying to find their footing in how to do that. And look, it's not the same for everyone. It's not the same in every season of your life, okay? But we have to be aware of the tension. We have to be aware and respond to the tension. So, so that's first. Secondly, in the background here in Revelation 2 at Thyatira is a world that is sex-saturated. And when I tell you today that our culture is sex-saturated, it is so obvious and so universally acknowledged I don't see much need to really go into detail to, to illustrate that. I, I mean, pornography, casual sexuality, guilt-free one-night stands, adultery, immorality, it, it, it's everywhere. Thyatira's Jezebel has a host of modern-day sons and daughters. 
The challenge for the church today is to stand against that compromising spirit and instead support biblical sexual values. And, and that needs to begin, we're not going to get in depth tonight or, or today, but, but we need to understand that in the Bible, sex starts not with a physical act. Not with a physical act. Instead, there is to be a relationship that leads to a commitment that makes a covenant before God, and, and, and that then creates a marriage bed that God blesses, according to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. And we ought to be teaching our children that when God created sexual desire, he also created a proper place for it to be enjoyed. Our teens, our young adults, frankly, all of us, need to be reminded that when it comes to matters sexual, less is actually more. Less is more. I mean, how romantic is it in a couple if someone were to say, look, I've had a whole string of sexual partners, or I've watched thousands of hours of pornography, let me show you all the stuff that I've learned. Really? This is one of the areas where being a pro is not a plus. In fact, it is far better to be stumbling, bumbling amateurs together in matters of love. But what if I mess up? Number three... The Son of God here in this email confronts the sin that was being tolerated in the church and their immoral lifestyles. And, and then this woman Jezebel and all of those who followed her teaching, they're called to repent. This is key. God always gives time and avenues for repentance. Now, if we choose not to, God will deal with us in severe ways. Verses 22 and 23 tells us some of the things that happened to these rebellious folks. And, and you might say to me, Martin, what would that include today? I, I don't know. What about all the sexual turmoil that we have in our culture and society, okay? I mean, we could just start there. What about the the many who are becoming sexually deadened in our culture. What, what about disease? Christ, though, is clear. I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now look, as believers, we're not expected to be perfect. None of us will be sinless. But we are expected to repent from sin. We're expected to avoid sin and, and not live spiritually compromised lifestyles. And if we do, we're to ask God for forgiveness, which God graciously always provides. Listen, if you're willing, you can be changed. If you are willing, you can be made clean. If you're willing, you can have a new start. If you're willing, your sins can be washed away. We're all saved, you see, the same way. By a free gift of God. To those who were scarred by the wrong choices in the past, if you're willing, you can be forgiven and made clean. You may still have to live with certain consequences of your past, but you can have the burden of guilt lifted from your heart. This morning, ultimately, the same option is before each of us that was before our brethren in Thyatira. 
we can repent. We can come to God. If this morning, in a public way, you need to respond, we want to sing a song of encouragement for you. Make your way to the front. Let your desire be known as together we stand while we sing. In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in heart, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. Please be seated. My only hope is you, Jesus. My only hope is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only hope is you. My only peace is you, Jesus. My only peace is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only peace is you. My only joy is you, Jesus. My only joy is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only joy is you. All that I need is you. Jesus, all that I need is you. From early in the morning to late at night, all that I need is you. This week I was in uh, Pittsburgh for, for work and I was sitting in the hotel room one night and uh, flipping through channels, lots of things on. But anyway, I saw a movie on, you've probably seen it, it's called Armageddon. Raise your hands, who's seen Armageddon? Okay. So some of you have seen that and, and some of you hadn't. So if you haven't, I'll, I'll give a spoiler alert here. But um, uh, I'll kind of run through kind of the end of that and how it relates to communion this morning. So where's he going with this? So. Uh, as I'm watching, I turn it on. It was the last part of it, and at the end of the show, I'll give the, the Cliff Notes version. Armageddon, large asteroids on target to destroy the Earth, uh, and, and, a, and a number of folks are sent to uh, to fly into space there, and uh, and drill in and, and blow up this asteroid and, and save Earth. Well, at the end, they run into problems, right? They run into turmoil and strife, and um, and somebody's got to stay behind, and they've got to sacrifice themselves. Uh, to blow this asteroid up and save the earth and uh, there's a number of astronauts and, and trying to figure out who's going to do that who's going to do that well they're running out of time time's clicking it's Hollywood they're running out of time and they said well, let's just draw straws so they draw straws and uh, and someone gets selected uh, it was fate they go down and uh, they're ready to ready to proceed 
Uh, it's Ben Affleck's character who draws a short straw, but his father-in-law, or potential father-in-law, I guess he's dating, uh, he's dating uh, Bruce Willis's daughter. So um, as they go down, Bruce Willis says, I'll escort him down. And right before uh, Ben Affleck's character gets ready to go out and do that, um, uh, the father, the, the elder, elder statesman of the group there, kind of pulls him back, uh, pulls part of his, his uh, equipment away so that he can't go out into space or he'll, 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 uh, he'll perish. So um, he does that. He takes that on. He, he makes that commitment to go out and be the one to stay behind, to make the sacrifice to, uh, to save the earth. And Ben Affleck's character says, you know, that was my job. And he said, no, your job is to just, is to, uh, is to, is to take care of my daughter. And I was thinking about that. He said, how does that relate? Well, you know, God didn't have a group of folks that he could draw straws. Um, he had his son. It was Jesus. And Jesus was his son that um, was perfect. Um, he, he didn't have to, he wasn't trying to make repentance himself. He was a perfect soul that... Um, you know, his death on the cross was not to save us from the physical destruction of, of the world, of earth, but to save us from the, the eternal uh, sin and strife and, and just the spiritual loss that we would have if that sacrifice wasn't made. So as I was sitting there that night, I, I started thinking about what would I do? How, what, what kind of commitment would I make? Would I be willing to sacrifice myself for my family, for this church, for the world, for the earth, whatever it may be? Uh, and as I was thinking this morning about that, it just kind of hit me. You know, that's what God did. He did that for us. He freely gave his son uh, on the cross uh, so that we may have the opportunity for eternal life, that we may have our sins washed away as we're all sinners. So a little bit of Hollywood to, to relate, but I think if we think about um, the direct example of what Christ did for us, it, it really is really applicable. Uh, we're going to bow now and give thanks for the, for the juice. It represents uh, Christ's blood. And, and for the bread that represents uh, his body uh, that, was, that was hung on the cross and the blood that was shed for our sacrifice, or for the sacrifice for us. Lord, bow with us. Lord, we're so thankful for the, the fact that you, you had a plan, you have a plan, that you were able to, uh, to sacrifice your son freely, uh, that Jesus was, was willing to be sacrificed on the cross for our sins that we had someone who, who would raise their hand and say, I'll take that on. That's my job. That's my job. My job so that, so that uh, folks, the, the individuals that follow, up, follow me will have the chance for eternal life. Lord, as, as we uh, partake of this uh, communion at this time, as we partake of the bread that represents Christ's body that was hung on the cross, we... Help us to be mindful of the, the, the pain that was experienced, that he was mortal, uh, that Christ walked on this earth, that he felt pain just like, just like we do, and also for the juice that represents his blood. Lord, help us to remember the, the pain and the agony as he was uh, staked to the cross, as blood dripped from his body, uh, and again, as that pain was felt, as he shed that blood. He shed that blood to wash our sins away as we sin. Uh, help us to just repent uh, and know that um, if we give ourselves to you in full, that we have that, uh, that, rep that, that forgiveness and we have that chance to walk with you eternally one day. Lord, we're thankful for this time of communion this morning. We pray that all those that have the opportunity to take communion this morning will just uh, take a few minutes to think about that sacrifice and, and know that you continually uh, are looking for, out for us each and every day. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Salvation belongs to our God Who sits upon the throne And unto the Lamb Be praise and glory, wisdom and thanks Honor and power Be to our God forever and ever. Be to our God forever.
Trust your grace. May my steps be worship. May my thoughts be praise. May my words bring honor to your name. May my steps be worship. May my thoughts be praise. May my words bring honor to your name. As I was looking through the bulletin this morning, I got excited. Uh, one, I'm glad to be here, excited to be here. I know we're missing a lot of folks. It's different today. There's no young kids here, right? 